Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, today I give a hopefully somewhat of easily understood overview about research in statistical machine translation on challenges and our current thoughts, how we address them. So um, I thought I'd start with some introduction, but everything I, it's on these slides was already said. So I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh and uh, John Hopkins. And if you want to try out the things I'm talking about, you can download the software and build machine translation systems at home. So we've been developing this for now almost 10 years. Um, also buy my book, <laughs> if you want to know how it really works. Um, uh, so I've been working on statistic machine translation for more than 10 years and uh, also working with companies, so I have a bit also appreciation of the real world challenges of machine translation today. Okay, so the first question you probably have is how good is machine translation? So I'll give you uh, a few examples. Um, so the first one is Chinese. So what does that mean? Nobody knows. <laughs> um, so if you run this through a machine translation system, you get this South China Sea Fleet Combat Patrol Far Sea Training Formation on the 21st Stereoscopic Beach Landing Training carried out in the South China Sea waters to participate in the training Marines Air Force. More than 100 officers and men from Jingwangshang Ship Troops Group. Okay, so it's not great, um, but you know more than you knew before. So you know this is an article about some training exercise of the Chinese military in this South China Sea Fleet and in South China Sea. I have no idea what a 21st stereoscopic beach is, but it sounds exciting. Um, so it's not, it, uh, it gives you an understanding of the text. That's something. Okay, let's try something else. So this is French also just randomly picked a uh, news article. Um, and here the translation is, the recipe was simple. The austerity budget would restore confidence in this growth. It would balance the public accounts and return of the activity. Good old British common sense. Thus spoke George Osborne, the preemptory and spirited chancellor of the Exchequer. It does not happen. Since coming to power, and so on and so on. So this is almost perfect. I mean, you could, some of these things are a bit odd like the return of the activity. So it's apparently economic activity, but the French just says activity, so that's how it was translated. And uh, there's some other flaws, but it's almost perfect, so this is kind of really good. So since I'm, since I'm here in Russia, I thought I'll, I'll run through an, a Russian example too. I just pulled that out literally 30 minutes ago from some random web page and ran it through Yandex a machine translation system, so the top stuff makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, and here's the translation, and you can probably judge for yourself how good it is. It sounds pretty fluent. So recent sociological research company Romria showed that, in the opinion of the Russians, this year the situation on the labor market has deteriorated significantly. The study authors defined it as, as depressive calm. It sounds a bit odd, but I don't know what the Russian means. Uh, similar conclusions may be found in other studies. Whether the situation and so on, so that's, you know, that's not bad, so I can live with that. So the, the question, of course, is what is that actually good for? So it's not perfect. And I think nobody who does machine translation research uh, is going to promise that things are going to be perfect because we made the mistake in the past. We always said, in 10 years, <laughs> you're going to solve the problem. Give us lots of money, in 10 years, you're going to solve the problem. That's a great sales pitch, but the problem is 10 years do pass, and then you look pretty stupid. So, um, so here's uh, a scale that I uh, got from a slide from DARPA, an American funding agency that came up with this scale. So HTR shortly means how many words had to be edited to make it a perfect translation. And this is kind of the scale. So they say 5% of the words have to be edited. That's publishable quality. If 15% of the words have to be edited, it's editable and gistable and triageable. Triageable is just basically, what is this text roughly about? Is it relevant to me? Is it not relevant to me? Is it worth someone else translates it for me properly? So here is maybe some application examples that I kind of pulled out of my head. Um, 
So if, it's, if you have 0% error, then it's seamless bridging of the language divide. So publishable means that you might be able to publish official announcement or something on your website, maybe put a warning on top saying machine translation, but it's going to be good enough um, to, to for people to read it and understand it fully. Um, so editable is a nice important threshold where it would be faster to edit the machine translation output instead of translating everything from scratch. So this is kind of, there's a certain threshold where um, machine translation becomes useful as a tool for professional translators. So it might be faster for professional translators to post-edit machine translation output than translating everything from scratch. And I'll say a good bit more about human translators at the very end of the talk. And so on. And so there's some other um, possible applications. So very often you don't really care about the exact content of the article. You just want to find specific information. Um, typical example, maybe your printer suddenly spits out weird error messages. What do you do? You're going to type in the error bar in your favorite search engine, the error message in your favorite search engine, and back comes a finished web page, which explains how to fix your computer. But it's finished. You don't know what to do with it. But if you can translate it into Russian or English, you can then maybe understand how to fix your computer. And it doesn't have to be perfect, fluent, beautiful language. It just has to give you enough information to fix your computer. Okay, so this is another kind of made-up example where we roughly are. So French-English, we, we do really well. So you saw the example earlier. So we might even be in a restricted domain good enough that you can just straight out publish the material with maybe a warning label. Um, um, it's definitely at the point where you can translate news stories and it's faster to post-edit that than translate from scratch. But for other languages like uh, German and Czech, we do worse. So I was not trying to guess where you are with Russian, English-Russian, because if I get Russian output, it looks very Russian to me and I'm not sure how good the quality is. Okay, so here is now kind of where we are. Now I talk about where we, what we're going to do about it to make things better. And we actually have a pretty clear plan. I mean, there's this, uh, this, the story I'm telling you is not necessarily new. Parts of the story has been around for 30 years, the other part maybe 10, 20 years. And everybody agrees, well, not everybody agrees, but I think there's some consensus that this might be a good way. So you could do this here. You could translate from the source, changing all the words somehow, and produce a target translation. Um, you could also become a bit more sophisticated and say, well, for some languages, there's a lot of reordering, there's different syntactic structure, so it might be better to do the transfer on a more abstract level, on a level of uh, syntactic analysis. So you first have syntactic analysis, then um, still a transfer stage, which might now be easier because you just only have to change tree structures instead of just shuffle words around and generate from that. So there's... Uh, a lot of talk about semantic modeling and semantic representation. It's not entirely clear what people mean by this, but that's definitely something out there on the research frontier that people work on. And ultimately, the idea is that you take the source sentence and put it in an abstract meaning or representation that is beyond all language. And then you don't have to do any transfer at all. You just parse into that meaning representation and generate out of this meaning representation. Um, the only problem with that is that nobody has really a good idea how that interlingua would look like. Nobody has seen it before. We don't really know how meaning is stored in our brain to inspire us how to build these structures. So that's a bit unclear what that really means. Okay, that's one idea. The other big idea is that we want to learn from data. So instead of building all the rules and dictionaries and reordering rules and whatever you need um, by hand, the idea is to learn all this from available text. So we have two types of text we want to use for this. One is called parallel text. So we have, um, so in this example, we always translate from a foreign language into English. So we have a foreign English uh, parallel corpus, which just means we have a lot of text that is translated from that foreign language into English. And uh, we're going to do a statistical analysis on that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk later a bit about text sizes, but you can think about hundreds of millions of words, maybe billions of words you can probably get for some of the bigger language pairs. 
And then you're also going to use uh, a lot of English text. So this is what you also do some statistical analysis and you build something called a language model. So this is there to ensure that the output is actually fluent in the target language. So you have two goals when you translate. And it's not always clear which goal is more important. A, you want to map what's in the source text as closely as possible. And B, you want to produce output that is as fluent as possible in the target language. And these are a bit in conflict. So sometimes um, we see it a lot with professional translators, or especially if you translate literature, you tend to more want to produce something that actually reads well and, and are willing to diverge quite a bit from the original. While if you do technical translation, you don't care about how beautiful it sounds. It, it's more important that you make no mistake and you stick as literally as possible to the original. So these are the two models and they both have some opinion about your translation. So uh, having these two models uh, allows you then um, to come up with a decoding algorithm that given an input string of words produces an output string of words so it translates from the foreign language to the English language and basically means finding the translation that has the highest score according to these models. So that's the big idea. So here's my only formula in the talk. I think it is. <laughs> this is uh, mathematically how we want to do this. We want to have a probability distribution over English sentences given a foreign sentence, and we want to find the English sentence that has the highest probability um, according to this probability distribution. OK, so why is that a good plan? Um, so here's. Uh, I'm going through some examples and say what we kind of think about it and what we're going to do about it. So this is a most obvious example everybody who thinks about translation um, might think of. So we have here two sentences. Um, he deposited mon money in a bank account with a high interest rate. Oops. Um, sitting on the bank of the Mississippi, a passing sh ship piqued his interest. So you have here two words, bank and interest, that have different meaning. And I think when I read this sentence, it was pretty clear to you what these words mean. So in the first one, bank is a financial institution where you put your money. And the second example, bank was the side of a river, so the shore of a river. And the same way in the first example, interest is if you put money in a the bank, they give you a per certain percentage extra every year. Um, and that's the interest. While the second one, it's more like a sense of curiosity, a sense of something being yeah, interesting of, and that's, you have to figure that out. So I know in German you would have different translations for these words if you translate into Russian. Maybe you have also different translations for these words. I would guess because they're very distinct meanings. So you have to figure out how can now the translation system figure out how to pick the right word. Um, so one hint there, and I'll, I'll have some more examples later, is the same way we do it. How did we figure that out? Well, we didn't just look at the word. We looked at the surrounding word. We read the whole sentence. When you have bank account, it's probably something to do with a financial institution. Just the following word helps us a lot to figure out what it means, or money in the, in the, in the environment. Uh, interest rate, if rate follows interest, that's pretty clearly indication that it means the, the money interest of interest, a money sense of interest. OK. Um, then there's this problem here. Um, so you have maybe expressions like this. It's raining cats and dogs. No idea how you translate that into Russian. In German, you would say it, it's schüttet aus Eimern, which literally means it pours from buckets. Maybe you have similar expressions here. Um, so you have to not only translate word by word. So sometimes they're just really larger units that you really have to translate as big chunks. OK, um, so another example is um, that there are a lot of syntactic ambiguities. Um, so here's also an example where you have different sentence structure and you have to do a lot of things. And there's a lot of ambiguity about this. So this is a very short forward German sentence. Das behaupten Sie wenigstens. And I put below each word kind of the most prominent translations for these words. So das could mean this or the. Um, behaupten means claim as a verb. Um, Z means either they or she, and then at least. So what's going on here? So this should mean um, they claim that at least. And it's 
totally obvious to a German speaker that that's the translation because of agreement, uh, verb agreement issues and other things. But how does this, you have to do a lot of reordering to get that in a, into an English translation. This is actually a sentence where our MT system fails on because it just gets completely confused. Um, so you have to convert from a, um, if you have linguistic training, you understand this jargon from an object verb subject OVS construction to a subject verb object construction. Uh, you have to resolve, resolve ambiguities that are not just you know, different word senses, but really different syntactic categories. The or does, I mean, that's a determiner, but it couldn't possibly be a determiner because there's nothing following the determiner. And, um, and why it's they and not she is really because of the inflection of the verb. Uh, if it would be she, it would be different inflection of the verb. So all these things have to be sorted out. So I used now a lot of languages like verb and agreement. So I'm hinting a bit that maybe we need to have some models that know what verbs are and what agreement is and what clause structure means and subject, uh, what a subject is and what an object is. OK, here's another example. So I um, guess you have exactly the same problem in Russian. So if I have the sentence, I saw a movie, I saw the movie and it is good. So it refers back to movie, which is also for a computer not an obvious thing to conclude. But let's, let's set that aside. Um, how do you translate it into German or French? So you would translate it, it into, well, you would first translate movie into film, which is then a female noun, therefore the it has to also become a female preposition. So you have to do a lot of reasoning here. So you have to figure out kind of the core reference link, you have to figure out gender identification of the noun, and then that help finally helps you to figure out what the translation of the pronoun is. So translating pronouns like this into, into German is actually really bad. So our, our standard system, if you run it, it gets 50% of these it's wrong because it really has no clue what gender it should assign and there are three choices, so it's not really that easy. Okay, that's just basically the story. Um, so our biggest problem with that is actually to do the core reference resolution to figure out what it refers to. Um, so there are people who work on that and we kind of basically use their ideas. Okay, here's now a really hard semantic problem and it's a bit artificial and it maybe it's a hint that these problems are not really all that frequent. So here's the sentence. Whenever I visit my uncle and his daughters, I can't decide who is my favorite cousin. So cousin in English could be male or female, but if I translate that into German, I have to, I have to say which gender it is. I can't, there's no gender neutral word for cousin. So I have to decide what it is. So the kind of logical inference you have to do here to figure out that they are definitely female cousins because they're daughters of my uncle. I mean, that requires quite a lot of world knowledge to, to, to pull that off. So this is not something anybody is seriously attempting right now in machine translation. Um, but it does also mean that I, I'm not, not going to claim here, oh, we're going to solve all problems in five years, because these kind of problems are really hard. and They really require you to do um, kind of artificial intelligence level reasoning about language. OK, here's now one final example uh, on discourse. Um, so since you, since you brought it up, I do not agree with you. And since you brought it up, we have been working on it. Um, so in the first sense is a meaning of since that means more like because. Um, and the second one is more a temporal meaning. Since you brought it up last year, we have been working on it. So it's, and that w you would translate um, differently into different languages as well. So you need to know something about how do different clauses relate to each other. Is it a contrast? Is it a temporal relationship between the two? And that's another hard problem that uh, we don't really have all that great solutions for. OK, I'll, I'll throw out one last problem, um, which is actually a really interesting problem. And I think if you remember one thing from the slide, I want, from the talk, I wanted to remember this example. So this is not, this is not cherry picked. This is a typical standard example. So you have a very short Chinese sentence. It's a headline of a story. Maybe that makes it harder, maybe not. I don't know. 
And there, this sentence was given to 10 different professional translators, and each of them translated the sentence. And they do not agree at all how the translation should look like. I mean, they all kind of mean the same thing. Israeli officials are responsible for airport security. Israel is in charge of the security of the airport. The security work for this airport is the responsibility of the Israeli government. The Israeli side was in charge of the security of this airport. Israel is responsible for the airport security, and so on and so on. And this is totally typical. So any non-trivial sentence, so anything over five words, if you get 10 people in the room, they will all come up with different translations. And actually, half of them are going to say the other half's translations are terrible and that's just all wrong. So it's not a, translation is not a task where you know what the right answer is, which makes it hard to kind of set it up as a machine learning problem because we don't really, we can never tell if the when the machine comes up with a translation, is it a good translation or a bad translation? Because we can't just simply compare it against the translation from a human translator, because just because they dis disagree doesn't mean it's wrong. So ultimately to know if, if a translation is correct or not requires some kind of semantic equivalence judgment and saying that two sentences have, or have the same meaning is, is one of the hardest problems you can think of. Okay, so much about the problem. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. Um, so the first one is, um, how do we translate a word? So if you come across, across a word like Sicherheit, um, dictionary says there are three different translations. It's either security and safety and or certainty. Um, so I came across this word already a long time ago and what puzzled me that it was not very clear to me what the difference between safety and security is. But they have very distinct meanings in English and you, can't really, you can hardly ever swap them out. So they do mean something else. I, if it would be an English audience, I would now ask you, what, does, what is the difference? Can you really tell me what the difference is? And they don't really know. <laughs> um, I guess you all know the difference. Um, so you could just collect counts. That's now our, our first standard solution. Just go with what's more frequent. So this is now from the corpus we have on, uh, from the European Parliament. That's a really great corpus. So the European Parliament proceedings are translated now into 24 different languages, so 24 official languages in the European Union. And all languages are equal, so everything has to be translated into 24 languages, um, um, which is a lot of work, and it's probably pretty useless, except for us. We get huge <laughs> parallel corpora. It's about now 50, 60 million words across 24 languages. Anyway, um, so we get statistics like this out of this. So we know, know from the corpus that Sicherheit is translated 14,000 times into security and 10,000 times into safety, and very rarely into certainty. Um, if you have a bit more context, so that's what I already alluded to earlier, if you know where it occurs in a sentence, so this is now all German compounds. So Germans, when you put two nouns together, you have to write them together. You can't just leave them apart. So here, Sicherheitspolitik, that's very clearly security policy. And then you have Lebensmittelsicherheit, which is food safety. And then there is Rechtssicherheit, which is legal certainty. So you get a bit of a sense, what's the difference between security and safety? Interestingly, there is actually a concept like food security, but it means something else. Food security means you have enough food to eat. Food safety means that the food you eat is not rotten. And there are a lot of other examples. For instance, there's job security. You're, you're safe that you don't, you're not going to lose your job. And there's job safety, which is you're safe that you don't get killed at your job. So I don't know if you know now what the difference is between security and safety. I still don't know. OK. So. Um, that's kind of the, the gist of the story. So we try to use statistics to make some decisions and uh, um, also maybe want to use some syntactic information or more linguistic knowledge in our models. So I'll now talk about uh, some of the work we've been doing recently uh, to build better models. Um, so one idea is 
um, to take the model that everybody has been using, and I'm quickly going to explain it and how to improve it. So this is the one slide summary of how Google Translate works. And maybe Yandex Translate works like this too. Uh, definitely Moses works like this if you use the, this, this type of model. It's a phrase-based model, so the idea is that you take the source sentence, you break it up into pieces, and then these could be one word, two word, three word phrases. They don't have to be linguistically motivated phrases at all. They could be like this example, Spaß am, which is fun with the, so it's kind of a very a chopped piece of, of text. And you have a huge table that tells you how to translate these source phrases into target phrases. And you could reorder them as well. So you have a, all you need for this to work is a huge table of phrase translation. These phrases can be typically up to five words long, or as long as it gets, as long as you want them to be. Um, it's more a question of how much disk space you have to store all these long phrases. And um, they can be reordered. And that's it. That's the entire model. So that's just pretty easy. Um, that's kind of the very cause. It makes absolutely no assumption about language in terms of um, linguistic structure, about verbs, about anything really. Okay, so here's uh, one problem with that. Um, so if you have a source sentence and you have phrases of different length that m match it, so you could have Spaß am, and then separate from that Spiel, or you could have Spaß and then separate from that am Spiel, or you're not even sure about the granularity, do you want to have one big phrase or do you want to have very little phrases? So this model is not very smart about that. So none of this has been properly addressed for a while. So um, uh, finally, uh, uh, a researcher back in Edinburgh has been thinking about this and came up with a different model. Different model. Oh, may, let, me, let me continue with the continue. The other one is that when you translate phrases, you're kind of stuck with this segmentation. So once you put in this line in there, that's the local context you consider during the translation process. So Spaß, I'm fun with, but maybe what's to the left of it, what's to the right of it, should decide, should prefer certain translation choices over others. But we're not currently doing this. Okay. So here's now how we're going to address this problem, that we don't really know how to break up the sentence into pieces. Should we use long pieces, small pieces, and where do you exactly to put, do we put the boundaries? Um, so the first idea is to just try to make the smallest phrases as possible. Okay, so in this case it would just break up Spaß am um, into two pieces. All the other ones are already pretty small. So is, why is that a good idea? That sounds like a really bad idea, because previously you had nice phrases, you had maybe interest rate, you had, you know, Spaß am, it's maybe even also a nice kind of bigram because the, the noun informs you about which preposition you should choose. So this is maybe not the greatest idea because you lose all the context, but you're very sure about what the segmentation is. Um, so you then consider the translation process as a sequence of steps. So um, there are these mapping steps where you just take a source phrase and map it to a target phrase, so this is called your generate. And so the first one would be naturally becomes of course. And then there are also operations to deal with reordering. So here you know you insert a gap, then you jump uh, then you translate something, generate John to John, then you jump back and then you translate hard to has and so on. So you have a bunch of these uh, operations. And uh, there could be a generation which means phrase translation, or you can also generate target only, which are insertions and deletions and all these things. Okay, here's now the trick. So when we have this sequence of operations, we condition on what the previous operations were. So first, what's the probability of the first operation? So then what's the probability of the second operation, given that I made just the first operation? And so on. So and we might condition it up to four different uh, previous operations, and then this makes it a five gram model. So if you know language modeling, this is exactly the same idea. And if you know language modeling, you also know what happens if I haven't seen these five operations in sequence, what are you going to do then? Well, you back off your job, always the most distant part of your history that you condition on, and then you uh, take that into account. So there are well-known smoothing methods how to deal with that. 
and um, that's kind of what we can use here too. Okay, so this is uh, one example of the kind of research we do to kind of improve the models we have. Um, here's now another example. Um, so this is, if you haven't taken a class in computational linguistics, this is maybe one of the important facts you have to learn about language. That the words in a language are very, very unevenly distributed. Um, so here are, again, statistics from Europol. So the word the in this Europol corpus from a few years back occurs almost two million times. So we should really know how to translate that. But then there are also 33,000 words that occur exactly once. So this is a corpus of about 20, 30 million words. And there are 33,000 words that occur exactly once. And they're not completely bizarre words. They're words like cornflakes, mathematicians, and Tajikistan. These words occur exactly once in the, in the corpus. So these are words you know. Um, I mean, it's somewhat understandable that uh, parliamentarians in, in the European Parliament don't really talk that much about conflicts, or apparently mathematicians. And Tajikistan seems to be a peaceful country because it didn't cause any trouble, so nobody wants to talk about it. It's, 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 uh, oh, it's a spelling error. Oh, that's great. Is it really? Yeah, okay, that explains. Okay, I have to look for that. I have to achieve that in a different spelling. Anyways, my point here is not, oh, that's actually another, you know, maybe a cause for sparse data because of a lot of spelling errors. But if it would be just spelling errors, you would just run spelling corrections. So uh, there's a, a law in, we don't really have much laws in computational linguistics, but apparently this is a law, it was, it's as good as a law. It says something about the relationship between the frequency of the word and uh, how like it's rank according to frequency. So if you take all the words and rank them to frequency, here in this example, they would be on the very top of the list, and these uh, cornflakes, mathematicians, and Tajikistan would be at the bottom of the list. Um, if, you, if you take the frequency of the word and its rank of the words and multiply these two numbers, you get a constant. Um, what this means kind of visually is if you take log scale, the rank of words, and log scale, the frequency of the word, um, you get this kind of um, distribution where you kind of get a straight line. And this kind of almost looks like a straight line. So, so the most frequent word here occurs uh, over a million times, and then you have a lot of words that occur only once. Okay. So we have... Pick, the reason why I'm telling this story is we have to deal with rare words. There are a lot of words that only occur really, really rarely. So if you have a document, there might be... A lot of words occur many times, but there are going to be a good number of words that you have seen extremely rarely, maybe not at all. So you have to tr still translate them, you still have to figure out how do they fit in a sentence, all these things. Um, so one idea is to just cluster words together that have similar meaning. So there's something called brown cluster, so there's an algorithm that automatically clusters words together with similar meaning, and um, it kind of comes up with clusters like this, so these are actually real clusters for words. So presented, the laconic message is maybe a very odd phrase you've never seen before, but knowing that presented means the same with as commissioned, published, aired, pursued, and the is something similar to, well, the you probably don't need to back off much, but something similar to these. And laconic means maybe something similar as pompous, melancholic, bouncy, incompletable, doesn't really mean all that same, but it's roughly in the same ballpark. At least they're all adjectives. And message, lesson, letter, counterfactual, stunner. Eh, kind of in the same kind of semantic space, too. So if you, if you don't really know if this is a good sequence of words, because you've never seen these words next to each other, you could then look at the word clusters and say, have these type of words occurred next to each other? So you can build a a sort of a language model, so something that tells you is it fluent language or not, based on the cluster. So how, how, how often have I seen from the cluster where message is in, given the cluster that the previous words were in? And that's a pretty nice uh, additional feature in your model that kind of is a ver way of smoothing your, your language model probabilities. Okay, so the next step that currently everybody is very excited about is word embeddings. 
So this is uh, something I stole from a web page, which has an example of word embeddings. So you can probably not read this, so here's a bit of a zoom. So there's a, a method using neural networks that clusters words together in a high dimensional space and then they collapse it down in a two dimensional space. You can look at them and you get kind of um, is the laser pointer here working. No. Anyway, you, you get like examples like in the middle there, scoring, playing, winning, losing, they're all grouped together. That's nice. Um, passing, running is next to each other. Run, hit, aired, broadcast. On the top there's cable. Media. So this, this looks pretty convincing. So people look at this and say, oh, that's pretty good. So you would want to basically represent a word, not by kind of saying it's a sequence of six characters, like, you know, O-N-L-I-M-E, but it has a certain semantic meaning and it occurs in a certain semantic space, and maybe its synonym has almost the same representation. So you want to represent words um, in some way where you can say similar words have similar representations and, and very different words that have very different meaning have different uh, representations. So this is, kind of, this is currently getting a lot of traction of instead of treating words as tokens and just modeling them as tokens and how often have I seen this token given previous tokens and so on is to, to work with these um, embedded representations. So there's um, now um, this whole resurgence of neural network research. It's now called deep learning, which just basically means a neural network with many hidden layers. So if you haven't paid attention in the late 80s, early 90s about what neural networks are, maybe you can uh, dig that up again. So it's probably too short time to explain how, how they exactly work. Um, the basic idea is you, you have some input and you're going to predict some output, but you don't just go directly from the input to the output. You have some intermediate layers where there are some nodes that have these kind of representations I just showed you, where word is represented by a vector of numbers. So this would be the first layer there. And then there's some other fur further processing down the road. And how do you learn these things the way you learn everything else? You, you know, have some known inputs, you have some known outputs, and you just then have um, pretty straightforward uh, machine learning methods to, to set all these weights. So, um, so if you were to go to a conference right now on statistic machine translation, nobody's going to talk about verbs and nouns. They all talk about encoding some word embeddings and deep neural network architectures and things like long short-term memory and recurrent neural networks and convolution networks and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. OK. Um, let's talk about something a bit more accessible, which is uh, uh, syntax-based models. So one of my ideas was we can do all this machine learning, we can do all this modeling, but maybe we want to pay a little bit attention to linguistics. You know, finally we talk about language maybe a little bit. <laughs> so maybe we want to build models that have some grasp of our common understanding of language. So what we work on is uh, uh, based on synchronous grammar rules. So if you studied linguistics at some point in your life or you have maybe paid attention um, when you learned kind of language in, in high school or so or studied your own language. And there are things like nouns and determiners and adjectives and uh, you can have even more abstract things like noun phrases. So a noun phrase is a description of an object which might consist of a determiner, adjective, maybe multiple adjectives, or a noun, maybe there are two nouns, maybe there are, you know, you know, the the happy and um, whatever, something, man. Uh, so you can have, they can get really large, so these noun phrases. It's just that they just describe one entity. This entity could then be the subject of a sentence or object of a sentence. So here's, uh, uh, typically you're going to have these rules. So you might have a rule in English saying a noun phrase is a determiner, an adjective, and a noun. And the equivalent rule for that in French would be the determiner, noun, and the adjective. So the f in French you 
often but not always put the adjective after the noun. Depends a bit what the adjective is. I don't really know what these people are doing, but <laughs> the typical example is that the adjective is after the noun. So this is the kind of rules we want to have in our system. A rule that very clearly states when you translate from French into English, you have to reorder the adjective after the noun. And that's what this rule basically says. So you have a rule, when you have a noun phrase, in French it looks like this, in English it looks like that. Uh, we're still going to have rules like our, from our phrase-based model. So maison becomes house, uh, the maison bleu becomes the blue house. And you might even have mixed rules where you say the maison adjective becomes the adjective house. So this is a rule that then can be used for the blue house, the green house, the yellow house. So you translate the adjective separately from the rest of the sentence. So here is um, how we get these rules. So we do the same thing we did before. We take a lot of text that is translated. We have figured out somehow which word is mapped to which other word. So this gives you at the bottom these dashed lines, which we call word alignment. And we parse at least one side of the parallel corpus. There are different opinions about should you have the syntactic analysis on the source side or the target side, or in the rules I just showed you, I kind of had them on both sides. So something like this. So this is just a simple example where you just have a parse tree for the English, but not for the German. And by just looking at this data you have, you try to extract rules. You try to figure out, is there some example where words line up and uh, is then uh, there a constituent in the parse tree that, that matches the whole piece? So the, um, the yellow rule is the one I'm currently trying to explain down here. So there's a verb phrase that we still have the words passing on, but then we're going to replace the other parts with uh, smaller phrases in the past tree, so which is a prepositional phrase and noun phrase, and that is mapped somehow into German, where you also have um, whatever the prepositional phrase and noun phrase correspond to first, and then the word aushändigen. So this is how you get these rules. So these are rules that map, in this case, from English text into syntactic structures, uh, from German text into syntactic structures in English. So when you translate with these, you can go through a German text, and while you translate, you not only replace words, you also build up syntactic structure on the target side. So this is kind of how these rules then are being used when you translate a sentence. So this sentence here is, again, a German sentence. Um, sie will eine Tasse Kaffee trinken, which if you gloss it or translate it word by word, it means she wants a cup coffee drink. That's how Germans talk. So, the, so you have a cup coffee, which is a bit odd. And what is even odder is this she wants drink. And there's a lot of stuff in between. So this is kind of the famous German example. The verb comes at the end. All kinds of stuff comes before, and only when the sentence finishes, you finally know what the people are talking about. So she wants a cup of coffee, drink. Um, pretty straightforward sentence. So you have then all these rule applications where you say, drink becomes, a uh, trinken becomes drink, that's a verb. So we also label it as a verb, so we can now know that's a verb. Kaffee uh, becomes coffee. Um, you have slightly more interesting rules like a cup of something becomes, or eine Tasse, something becomes a cup of something and that something is a noun and the whole thing is a noun phrase. Um, the action is kind of in rule number five where that reordering happens. So you have here a rule that says, yes, you're going to put in a verb there and you put in a noun phrase, but they get flipped in order. So when you translate that, you then in English have wants to drink a cup, co cup of coffee, while previously in German the order of these two things was different. So that's why these lines going down um, intersect and at the end you kind of deal with a she. So this is a um, syntax-based translation model. So we still kind of map little pieces, we break up the translation process in these little pieces, but now we not only translate it into English words, we also build up nice syntactic structure. Having that allows us then to do all kinds of other things on top of it. Um, for instance, we might want to check if you have good subject-verb-object relationships. So, so if you're not sure about what is the object and what's the subject, like the typical German example where you don't know if you start with the object and subject, you know, the president agrees, sounds like a good construction, presidents do agree occasionally. Uh, and uh, 
presidents agree. Uh, yeah, okay, that's just a <laughs> agreement issue. Uh, so president agrees, both are singular. Presidents agree, that's both are plural. So these are good constructions um, that you can check by, by knowing that they are related. So one is the subject and the verb. Um, so he says, I say, same example. Um, um, by verb categorization, I mean, so sh she claimed that, that's a good construction, so she or people who say something can claim something, while that claims she, that's kind of what in English, so that some kind of abstract noun usually doesn't claim anything. Um, so uh, all these agreement issues uh, and so on. Um, so you might wanna, so the way you can do this is by um, basically not having just these grammar rules which says, uh, you know, you ultimately produce a sentence out of a noun phrase and a verb phrase is to add additional constraints that the count of the noun phrase has to agree with the count of the verb phrase, the, the person, which means, um, yeah, first person, second person, third person, agrees with the person of the noun phrase and so on and so on. And you might propagate up some information about what is the head word. Um, so these kind of models, um, so f we've been working on it for a while. Um, this is work that originally started at least this kind of work at the ISI, which had really good results with Chinese English already years back, and we now have better results on translating German. So German always <laughs> was a big problem for us. It's very annoying to me, it's my native language. <laughs> But it, we do really badly, and the main reason we do really badly is because it's syntactically very different from English. It's very odd. They're, they're very related languages. The vocabulary is very similar, but the grammar is very different. So we now have better results with these uh, syntax-based systems for German-English and English-German. So this is the percentage when you pairwise compare the output from a, from a phrase-based system and a syntax-based system, uh, how often the syntax-based system is preferred. We got all excited and we run it over every other language pair we could get our hands on. Czech, uh, Russian, Hindi. Um, we were only successful for Hindi. <laughs> so for Russian and Czech, we didn't do as well. Um, not entirely sure why that is. Uh, there's a little bit more tweaking involved with these models because the syntactic representations you get, you might want to make sure that they're really suitable for the rules you want to extract. So you might have to massage these past trees a little bit and this is basically the linguistic annotations. So Hindi is kind of interesting because it's a, that was a low resource example, meaning we didn't have much data. So we only had like a million words or a few million words, while for the other ones we had hundreds of millions of words. So maybe that's a sign, and this is not the first result that showed that for low resource languages, these syntax-based models do better. So it might be that if you don't have much data, knowing a lot about what is fluent language and what is, what is kind of uh, proper usage of language in the target language might help you a lot. Okay, um, final point in terms of modeling uh, or improving MT I want to talk about is data. Um, I don't have yeah, let's go over that. So you need three things to m improve your MT system. So I got to constantly asked today what you have to do to get, make our MT system better. And you have to do better machine learning, better modeling, and need more data. <laughs> so what are you going to do about data? So first I'll give you some sense about what data we have and how much data we have. So here's my back of the envelope estimation how much you read in your lifetime maybe 300 million words. So a novel is about 100,000 million, 100, 200,000 words. So if you read uh, maybe one novel a, a week or every two weeks, you probably get there. So this is about 2,000 2, books. Maybe you read more in your lifetime, I don't know. But it's roughly there. So, um, and below that is how much uh, words the computer has access to. So we have, uh, in terms of translated text, so not just the text in a language, but also the translation into another language, often billions of words. So that is already more than you can read in your lifetime. So a computer has access to more translated text than you'll ever be able to read. So we can't just give you all the translated text and ask you, can you check if everything is correct? You're just not gonna have enough time to check that. And what is even worse, if you just want to look at monolingual 
the text. So for English, if you just go to the internet and just download everything that is in English, and some people do that, apparently there's a company that downloaded the entire internet just for the fun of it. Um, so you have trillions of words of English. I don't know how many words of Russian you have, but probably also in the order of hundreds of billions. So this is vastly more than you are able to read, and vastly more than you ever be confronted with as a human being. So computers have some edge over us but when it comes to language. Obviously, the computer doesn't know anything what all this stuff means, but it can read so much more. So it actually might know more about words and how they're used and what is the right word to, way to use the word than you have. So a word that you have maybe heard only a few times, you might not really know what's the proper way to use it. A computer has seen then thousands and thousands of instances of it and knows exactly how that word is being used. Um, so typically, we get this data from the web. That's the easiest. There's a lot of stuff out there on the web. Everybody nowadays publishes everything on the web. So you just download everything from the web. Um, so if you're not Yandex, you have access to a, something called Common Crawl. So there's a publicly available crawl from the web. It's uh, hosted on Amazon Web Services, but everybody can download it. It's like some pro non-profit organization that, that sets it up. It gets regularly updated. It's uh, every half a year, they just crawl as much as they can. And each time, they get like two to four billion web pages. And it's currently filling up uh, all the hard drives back in Edinburgh. And <laughs> when I'm back at Hopkins and get new computers, I'm going to fill up all the hard drives there, too. So it's about uh, actually 20, 30 terabyte of data, which might still sound scary to some people. But you can now buy five ter terabyte hard drives. So you just need about five or six of them. You know, it's a stack of hard drives this high. It's not that much. OK, so uh, we, we, we did a lot of things with that. Um, um, the furthest we've gotten is just to just get monolingual data out of there. So all we, all we have to do is, with all the texts out there, is we run language detection. We have to figure out, is this English, is this Russian, is this Spanish, is this German? Um, so there are tools for that. You can run that over the data. Um, you have to uh, uh, figure out if something is duplicated and then remove it. Um, so it should be deduplication, not reduplication. Um, there's a lot of issues with Unicode encodings and 10 different ways how to write a comma, so you have to normalize that. Um, you also want to split things into sentences, because a lot of our processing then assumes everything is in sentences. And this is how much we got. Um, for all these different languages. So we didn't get all that much for Russian and French, but it's about 20 billion words. Mm, that's still a good amount, so you're not going to read through that quickly. Um, and it's about a trillion words of English. Um, at, the at the end uh, is, uh, if we build a language model on that data, how much does it help us in machine translation? So if you're familiar with the blue score, and you're familiar with the WMT competition, you would say, oh, that's, that's a that's a good gain, you know, half a blue point on blue point just by adding data. I'll, I'll take that. If you don't know what that means, it, it just basically means what I just said. It's good. Um, um, maybe one point. So this has made the difference between our research system at University of Edinburgh being worse than Google versus if we add this, our research system is better than Google. Um, it might be still worse than Yandex, I don't know. <laughs> um, so the other thing you can do is extract parallel data. And we haven't done this as thoroughly, so we didn't get as much data as we could have. It's a bit of a harder task. So you not only have to detect which language a document is, you have to figure out where is the translation of the document. They might be linked to each other, maybe not. You see, it's a really, I mean, you have billions of web pages. You maybe have 100 million English web pages and 100 million Russian web pages. Which one belongs to which is not exactly trivial. So you have to align the documents, you have to extract then all the HTML out of it, uh, uh, so strip the HTML out of it to just have the text. You have to align the sentences to each other. And there's a lot of noise, and you have to do a lot of filtering. And the copyright notice at the bottom of the page, you don't really want to have that 100,000 times. So this is um, how much data we got out of it. So for French, about 100 million words. For German, a little bit less. And for Russian, 30 million words. So these are healthy numbers, but there's much more work to be done. And you can definitely get much more um, text out of this. 
Okay, um, do I want to talk about this? So there's all kinds of issue, other issues with, in terms of data. Um, the typical case is you want to translate a certain domain, like web news articles, like I had earlier, or if you are a company like uh, Dell or Microsoft and you want to uh, adapt your user manuals, you want to translate user manuals and you care about that kind of language. So you always have a mismatch between the domain of the, 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 the target that you want to translate and all this data you crawled from the web, which might be all kinds of random stuff. So there's a lot of mismatch, so you have to deal with that. I'm not going to go through all this list. Anyway, so as a student who just graduated, did her PhD thesis on topic modeling, trying to figure out how do you merge in-domain and out-of-domain models. There's also a lot of things you can do with manufacturing new data, especially if you have to deal with languages like Russian, which have a lot of morphology, and I heard today a lot about Turkish, which has apparently horrible morphology, uh, monster words. Um, so then you might want to fill up gaps in your data by manuf manufacturing additional entries in your phrase tables. You haven't seen this morphological variant, but you can also translate the English phrase into another morphological variant, so you have to add all these things. There are things like transliteration, so whenever you come across a name that is spelled in Cyrillic, a writing system and you have to translate that into English, suddenly you have to convert it into a Latin writing system, so you have to deal with that. Um, there are some words you just don't translate, um, similar to names, but also numbers and things like that. And then there are misspelled words, apparently Tajikistan is misspelled, so we just should have fixed that. And then it would have been super frequent and we knew how to do with it. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of data cleaning, subsampling. Um, often you don't need all the data, you want to throw away some of the data. Um, I think I'll skip that. Um, there's a lot of work on, yeah, it's great to have all this data and your hard drives fill up, and yeah, still you have, you have, you have this stack of hard drives, um, which is a mixed blessing because A, it helps you a lot, but, on a sec but maybe you don't have enough compute power to deal with this. So when we built, for instance, the English language model on this trillion of words, we would have needed a machine with five terabyte of RAM, and we don't really have that. <laughs> so we have to figure out how do we compress all that data in a way um, that it works. Um, yeah, today I heard at Yandex, they also work a lot on an offline translator that work, runs on your cell phone, and your cell phone doesn't have that much this RAM or whatever storage, so you have to compress it even more. So how do you do that efficiently? So there's been various work in this area. Actually, I just saw David Talbot coming in who has been working on randomized language models while he did his PhD in Edinburgh. So quick shout out. Um, um, and you, or you might want to translate all this stuff over uh, multiple systems. And then you have, um, so this is something that Google did 10 years ago when there was even less RAM, and they had this trillion word language model, and they just spread it out over a thousand machines, which is then a lot of work and headaches. Okay, so this is now everything how to make your machine translation system better. As I said, um, more machine learning, more linguistic modeling, and more data, and then figuring out how to deal with all that data. And the last topic I want to talk about is uh, research I've been doing over the last years. Um, so one of the uses of machine translation is the web page translation. You know, there's something in a foreign language, you run it through your favorite translation engine and you get something you understand and you're happy and that's all it. Or you use a chat application where you just send back and forth messages, so you translate your email. But another application is to use machine translation as an um, initial step for professional translators. So this is slowly taking over the translation business. So all these translation companies that deal with professional, high-quality human translation um, increasingly see evidence that it's faster to translate from s uh, for, uh, by post-editing machine translation output than translating from scratch. So here's a chart that I got from Autodesk. So they made a study, so this is a big software company in America. Um, they have a big translation need. They're selling software. They want to sell it all over the world. Therefore, they have to translate the manuals into various languages, and you can't just run the manuals through MT. You have to actually translate it by hand. And here are all the examples where the speed um, with post-editing and the speed by translating from scratch. So the scale here, I think I'm 
not, I don't actually have what the scale means, but it's the number of words you translate per hour. Um, I think the typical numbers, they are like 500 words per hour, maybe 1,000 words per hour if you're fast. And uh, the, all the red bars are if you just translate from scratch, and then the green bars are if you post-edit machine translation output. So this is kind of a bit of an ideal situation for machine translation because it's a very limited domain and they probably have a lot of manuals from the previous year, so there might be a lot of overlap between what you translate now and what you, translate, what you had to translate last year. So there's a new printer coming out, but a lot of the instructions in the printer manual are pretty much the same. So you can build really good machine translation models that really fit very well um, the kind of text you have to translate. But they do claim productivity increases ranging from 40%, um, like Chinese, to 130%. Um, for French. So these were also the two extremes of the languages that I showed earlier. Um, I don't see Russian in the scale, so I'm not sure where that falls. Um, so translators are used to translate from scratch, obviously. Take the source sentence and just type away the target translation. Um, there is uh, a technology that is pretty established in the market since 10, 20 years, called, it's called translation memory. That is just a way to, you have to translate a sentence, let's try to find, have I translated the sentence before, or at least have I translated a very, very similar sentence before, and it then just shows you that sentence. So it shows you the previously translated sentence and how similar it is to something called fuzzy match score. It says like how similar it is to something to the one that you have to translate right now, and they use this as a basis, so they just then maybe post-edit the, transla the f uh, translation memory match. And now they increasingly are uh, confronted with, not always to their pleasure, uh, by having to post-edit machine translation output. So um, our question was, can we do something better for translators? So the machine translation system doesn't only produce the one best translation. It might actually give all kinds of information that might be useful for the translator. Um, and it might even be more fun to do use than post-editing machine translation. So here's um, my example. So if someone has to translate the sentence up there, and the professional translator then says, OK, I have to start translating this. So I don't know how good your German is. So literally this means he has since months planned in November a lecture in Moscow to, to hold. Again, that's how Germans talk. Um, so the system would just suggest he. And the user could say, yeah, I like he. And then the system suggests the next thing. So if you use a cell phone to write email or text messages, this might look very familiar. Um, and you, and if you write an e email kind of text message with this kind of auto-suggest, um, it is okay, but not great. The additional benefit we have here is we know what the source sentence is, so we know what you roughly want to write. So we can make much, much better prediction than in your autocomplete for your email. Um, ideally, if the machine translation is perfect, you would just accept everything that, that is suggested to you. Um, so let's just go through this. So he says has, I like that too, and then four months, and then like, ah, I'm not really four months. I ha he has for months, none of this really makes any sense anymore. Let's go back and fix that. Let's say planned, he planned, and then the system has to recalculate and make new suggestions. He planned for months, and then it says to give him a lecture in Moscow. And um, Okay, so, we might also have some more information to the user. So here is the example. We suggest that the next word should be in, and we suggest that because we think it's a translation of the German word im in the source language. So it might be good for, us, for the translator to know where did this come from, why are you suggesting this? So you can actually then look, it's much easier to look back and forth between the translation you generate and the source sentence. Um, and we might also, um, show that all this stuff in gray you have already translated and only the stuff left in white still needs to be translated. Um, so this is the kind of interactivity we're working on and we actually just completed a European project where we built such a system where you can do translation in this way. Um, another feature of this uh, system is that it shows you for all the input words and phrases multiple translations. Um, this one is not that such an exciting example unfortunately because 
since months. There's not that many ways you can say that. Um, but if you look at the last one, and in Vortrag, it could be a lecture, a presentation, a speech, a statement, a general. So there's always some junk in there too. So it gives you some suggestions how you translate it. So um, your passive vocabulary is much larger than your active vocabulary. So the words that you understand are much more than the words you would actually actively use and think of when you when you uh, write something. So this is just a good way to come up with words that are in your passive vocabulary, and then when you see them, you say, oh, these are really good words. Um, I, wanna, I wanna use them. So it, it gives you some more diversity and word choices. Um, one interesting thing we did with this kind of display is, it actually allows you to translate sentences from a language you don't know at all. So we did Chinese and Arabic translation into English with people like me who don't know any Chinese and Arabic. And it's, it's, been more, it's easier to do that with this kind of display than with just plain uh, taking the output of MT system because you get a bit of better understanding of what does this really mean and I don't like this sounds odd but what are the other options and what are the other choices. So you can, it's actually a nice puzzle. <laughs> so you get all these little text blocks and there's obviously some diversity in there and you can figure out what it means just basically um, by your language model and by your world knowledge of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Okay, um, so another feature is uh, useful, might be useful for these tools is uh, the machine translation system telling you do you believe the translation is correct or not. So the machine translation system not only providing you with the translation but also an indication, uh, yeah, I'm not so sure about this one. So maybe if we have users post-edit machine translation output, we don't show them the really crappy translations, which only makes them mad at us and uh, want us hate us even more. Um, so we only show them the good translations. So we need some automatic way to score the confidence we have in the translation. So there's different ways to do this. It could be done on a whole document. Um, on a sentence level, on a word level, maybe we want to even indicate which words we got wrong. Um, um, so the translators are already used to this fuzzy match score that I talked about earlier. So they get these retrievals from the translation memory and say this is 80% match to your source sentence. So we might want to produce something similar. We also produce a score like this. So we think that this sentence you're going to change 10% of the words. Or in this sentence you're going to change 50% of the words. And if, if this would be actually accurate, it would give some advice to the translator, should I even bother looking at it? When I have to translate, fix 20%, 30% of the words, I might just ignore it and just start over from scratch. So another idea we have in this, and we have basically done, is the idea, while you translate a document, you actually produce training data for our machine translation engine. So you produce new sentence pairs. So you have new source sentences. You provide now a new translation for it. Previously, we didn't know how to translate the sentence, but having now this example, so we, we um, have it running through the post-edit, I have this human translation. We can then use it to retrain our engine and maybe even doing more than that because it's not just another sentence pair. It's also direct feedback about what errors our system makes or what our errors our systems shouldn't make anymore. Okay. That's the whole story. Uh, I'm just going to um, summarize as much as I can. Um, so these are the things you should we, we want to work on. Um, so better machine learning, as I said. There's currently a lot of interest in neural networks for uh, machine translation. And they're also now super popular in, in computer vision and speech recognition. So this is kind of the, the fun thing to do. Um, you have the right to be a bit skeptical about machine learning. Every five years, there's a new machine learning method, and everybody gets super excited about it, writes lots of papers, and then five years later, some, something new comes up. But that's the current exciting thing to do. Um, there's uh, linguistically more motivated models, so I showed you a bit examples of syntax-based models. More data is good. It's always good. Um, I didn't quote this here. There's a there's an interesting uh, researcher who already 10 years ago said, stop thinking, just collect more data. And if you really want to think, think about how you can get more data. So <laughs> that's definitely a truism in the field. So if you have, 
you know, 10 times more evidence about how things are translated, it's going to make a big difference. Um, of course, with data, you might also have to deal with uh, uh, data weighting, cleaning, subsampling, and then there's a whole issue of what is machine translation actually good for. Machine translation is never end goal. You always actually want to do something else. You want to fix your printer. So the being able to translate the Finnish web page into a your language, okay, great. Does it fix my printer? Or, you know, you want to produce high quality translation. Does the machine translation help you? Ultimately, you want to produce your high quality translation by yourself, and so on. Okay, that's it for me. If you have any questions, happy to answer. So, if you want to ask. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'll give you the microphone. And uh, we have a small prize for the best question. So if you could, <laughs> if you could pick one in the end of the Oh, no, I'm not going to pick one. This is just terrible. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? Oh. Yep. Great. So you were talking about big data and collecting those parallel texts yep. uh, from the web. But we know that more and more of that data is actually being generated by the same kind of algorithms. Yeah. So what do you think about this process starting to feed on itself? Yeah. So that's a real problem. I think that's, uh, so Google has been worried about this for a long time. They even have like a method called watermarking where they kind of put in subtle cues in their translations so that afterwards can detect was it generated by their MT system or not. So, but yeah, this filtering stage of you just get something from a web page and it's a translation doesn't necessarily, you have to do a lot of filtering to figure out is it rubbish, is it machine translated, is it not really a literal translation and was it just, you know, written by a really bad translator or, so that's, that's a definitely a challenge. So yeah, you have to throw away a lot of the data you find out there. Uh, hi, Philip. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So, uh, my question is, uh, first of all, uh, do you anticipate some uh, major changes in uh, machine translation paradigm or in statistical machine translation? Because well, uh, there is a lot of work uh, going on in this area, but mm -hmm. uh, most of it is like well, local, something like cleaning, pre-processing data, filtering the data, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm working with uh, some technical issues like memory, uh, spe uh, speed, mm -hmm. and so on. So do you ex uh, anticipate something that could be a breakthrough? And, well, the second part of the question, uh, what, uh, in your opinion, uh, an ideal uh, machine translation system would look like? Uh, is it going to be based on statistical machine translation or something else? Yeah, I thought I, I, I kind of laid out the long-term vision pretty clearly. So you need to have an interlingua, neural network trained statistical machine translation system. How are we going to do this? I have no idea right now. Um, I'm always a bit skeptical about like what is the big revolution because if you really look at the field, there's a lot of incremental change. So these things don't, these ideas don't come out of nowhere. They're kind of someone tweaks this a bit, someone tweaks a bit more, someone then realizes, wait, this actually fits in a completely different way of looking things, and then the progress is always somewhat incremental. So, but, yeah, I don't expect, I mean, I, I kind of laid out <laughs> some ideas where, where the future goes to, and, and, and there's definitely uh, big debates in the field about what I just talked about. Should it really be, is it all just a machine learning problem? Should you just ignore all this linguistics? This is some people who just have some crazy ideas about language, but it's as kind of as questionable as anything. Or should you just say it's not really about machine learning? You really have to model the problem better. You have to deal with morphology in a smarter way than just saying words that are spelled similar, or maybe morphological variants or not, or just treat all these words differently. So there's always an argument between do you need better machine learning or do you need better linguistics? And uh, I don't claim to know the answer. I, th I believe that both of these things are important. So, um, by combining and improving uh, machine learning and linguistics, do you think uh, we can get an ideal machine translation system with, which could, well, 
supposedly uh, translate like a human any text from any domain. As I said, I'm not going to promise perfect machine translation until after I retire. <laughs> so, I mean, there are, I, mean I, I gave you some examples at the beginning where, where translation is really not just mapping from the source to the target some words or phrases or even syntactic structure, where you really have more information content in the target language than in the source language. There's a lot of the problem with Chinese. If you translate from Chinese to English, they don't have plurals, they don't have verb, verb, uh, verb tenses. So if you're somewhere in the middle of a document, that information has to come from somewhere. So you have to do much more work to get that right. And if it comes then to translation decisions that are based on some really deep semantic reasons, well, you need to have all these deep semantic representations and inference, and that's often out of reach of what we're doing right now. So I'm pretty optimistic that we make continued progress, and there has been continued progress over the last years, and, but yeah, perfection is a long way to go. Uh, hello. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One uh, about the development of these systems, and the second a bit philosophical. So mm -hmm. the first one is the role of ontologies in machine translation. I saw mm -hmm. slides about topic modeling, about uh, latent uh, text analysis or corpus analysis, uh, but uh, nothing about uh, un explicit ontologies. Yeah. And uh, how can we combine them and use two types of ontologies? Uh, yeah. Some like BubbleNet, which gives us yeah. many senses of words, or, or Sumo, which gives us the hierarchy of words. Yeah. And the second uh, model, um, ontology, which gives us language modeling. This uh, yeah. noun usually models this and this and this. Yeah. And there, I may be wrong, but there was nothing about this in your presentation, but yeah. it's a big place of science. Uh, yeah. trans trans sorry. And the second one question is that uh, uh, it's very good to use as Dale like Tradas when you translate uh, some financial document or formal agreement and so on. But when you deal with um, with a book uh, of some author, uh, and uh, I have an idea. One good artist told uh, that. It's much more complex to draw a good curve line than a good straight line. Mm -hmm. And uh, this SDL gives you one good translation all the same time. And uh, poor style, the same way you translate, uh, when, when, when you translate different books in the same way. You know? mm -hmm. uh, it makes uh, the whole corpora more poor and destroys it uh, in a long period of time. You know? Okay, I didn't quite catch your second question. I have an answer to your first question. Let me ask, uh, answer your first question, and then I ask you about your second question. Yes. So, ontologies. Um, so, I think what I, I didn't talk about it, and I don't know anybody who currently uses it. The only case where I knew that someone used something like WordNet in translation was there's an unknown word. Let's look it up in WordNet, figure out what its hyponym is, and then translate that. So that's, that's the only case where I, where I know people have used this. I mean, a lot of the, the modeling we do has similar intuitions like ontologies, that words are semantically similar, and maybe that helps you in translation. So the examples I gave you with the word clustering, it's all done automatically. It's not using any handwritten ontologies, but it's, but it's really using this idea of synonymy and so on. Really, really very slowly. I yep. tried it, and you cannot do uh, topic modeling on millions of documents it will destroy your computer. <laughs> uh, a speed, and there's a lot of engineers who make things faster. No, I'm not, yeah, so it's, it's not clear, and it's not clear to the field how much these hand-built resources are going to be used. And I'm not, I, I could now be completely in the machine learning camp and saying, wow, well, we're so going to rebuild all this automatically. You know, we can just automatically deduce from lots of text if something is a part of something else, or if something is a hyponym or something else. Or, what are, the, what are synonyms? We can all, all do this super automatically. And there are certainly people who work on that. Um, so this, this kind of more richer linguistic or knowledge-based information is going to come into play when the models are ready for it. So if your model is just really stupid and just translates little chunks of text, then it's not clear where these ontologies fit in. But if you get into more linguistic structures like parse trees and 
and start talking about semantic representations, then suddenly these things might become more relevant. Um, it's not clear if these have to be hand-built or automatically learned. But yeah, so your second question was? Oh, I'll try it again. So machine translation is good for formal texts, yep. but when you have uh, um, a different, more, uh, I don't know. Yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, so uh, are you talking about like literature translation? Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't yeah, want to yeah, use yeah, that yeah, too. Yeah, and I think it. that's a fair point. I mean, I heard that from um, translators a lot. So, so there are translators who translate Microsoft mu user manuals and they don't have any great literary ambitions. They just want to translate this stuff and be done with it and work or to translate a thousand words whatever a day or two thousand words a day and that's how they get and the money. And there are people who want to translate Shakespeare and novels and even in, in more prosaic world uh, translate marketing material where it's really not so much about <coughs> let's quickly translate the meaning. It's more about how does it sound in the target language and which audience do you really address and how does it culturally differ from the audience in like the, the foreign language country and you have to think much more about what is you know appropriate language use. So there, there obviously machine translation is not necessarily a useful tool as a, as a first step mm -hmm. because it's much more about the writing and fluidity than kind of a one-to-one -one mapping from source to target. And it seems that the score of how many words you should change to mm. get the good translation is yep. not correct for this type of text because yep. sometimes you need to change all the sentences yeah, yeah, yeah. and reconstruct yeah, I it. Mean, there's, I mean, there's all these kind of, you make a reference to some obscure cultural mm. thing in the source language and you can't, you can't have the same reference because none of your readers will know what you're talking about. So mm. you have to come up with something that has a similar mm. impact on the reader. So you have to put that in. Okay, so thank you. That's, that's a very different task. So we're not trying to compete with that at all. Um, hello. Uh, I've got a question uh, uh, about, well, you said that uh, one of the core features of machine translations is when, the main question is when you need to get more data. Mm -hmm. The more data you get, the better statistics you have. Yeah. So, and uh, do you have any, uh, well, kind of user contribution programs when you, uh, you shuffle and translate and anonymize data and just use it to increase the product quality? Do you have some, just something like this? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Do we uh, anonymize data or? Uh, the question is about uh, when there are lots, uh, you uh, try to uh, make a good product that uh -huh. translates text and then uh, uses, uh, uses this product, product. But still we uh, very often can find some fun examples of absolutely messy translations. Okay. Uh, but when uh, there are lots of users that manually correct this yeah. and uh, would, it, would it be better to just uh, maybe uh, yeah. give an option to the user to anonymously collect this data okay. to improve the whole product. Yeah, so I, so I know that Google... It's kind of a lot of resources. Yeah, yeah. so I know that Google Translate has this feature where you can say, uh, change this translation, correct this translation. Um, from what I know, they don't really talk much about anything, but from what I heard is that they don't, don't really use this much for as additional training data because people also just put in random things, so you have to really separate the good corrections from the just bad corrections. But they do use this for error detection. So if suddenly everybody changes one word to another word, then maybe you did something wrong. And it's kind of a good use feedback to, to, to find errors in your system. So they use it for that. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we at, you know, as a university, we don't really provide machine translation as a service to the world out there, so we don't, we are not even in the situation to, to take advantage of user feedback, but, I mean, uh, in these computer-aided translation tools, this is a core feature that you take the, the, the corrections from the user as additional training. Okay, data. thank you. <coughs> you told that uh, you use data from multiple translations of, uh, documents of European community. Yep. I wonder, uh, can you guess when they, uh, you, they will start using your system? Uh -huh. Or maybe they do? Um, they actually do. <laughs> yeah. 
So there's a group at the European Commission that basically uses our software and builds machine translation systems, and um, we know them, and we know what they're doing, so. Um, can a semant semantically meaningless text be translated with the, with the proper grammar in a machine translation? Um, so this was a question of meaningless text with proper grammar, or I didn't quite catch the whole question. Well, uh, yes, the text to yeah. where the roots are yeah. meaningless, but okay. the affixes are grammatically correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we are in no way to know if something is meaningful or not, and we just, I mean, the the machine translation systems typically translate very literal and well. Can it div divide the words into more themes? Can it divide the words into more things? Are you talking about morphology now? Can it? Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm not catching your question really. Well, yes, that's part of morphology, mostly. Uh, so yeah, so we do. Um, so there are different ways to deal with morphology. So a lot of like Russian words, for instance, have a lot of word endings, and I heard again today a lot about Turkish, where you have a lot of word endings, and you will do better by breaking up words into pieces and then translate the pieces. Well, hi. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming here and sharing your view. And uh, I would like to personally thank the Yandex uh, for hosting this. Uh, and my question uh, somehow relates with something I've heard from that uh, man. <laughs> because, um, well, um, I'm dealing with uh, MTP on a daily basis, mm -hmm. working in the translation company. Okay. But um, would you say that <laughs> your presentation was more about uh, challenges of creating the proper mm, MT engine. Yep. Because um, my um, most important question is, and I guess it's not only for me, but well, for a lot of people, is um, how do you actually, do you have you know, uh, some kind of a recipe of uh, convincing people like um, Russians, for instance, mm -hmm. Russian mm -hmm. professional translators, to believe that MT really does good. Yep. Because my actual, um, the major challenge, I guess, which I face every day is that I just still can't cope with the um, negativity okay. I gain from professionals who just don't want to um, yep. process with it. Yep. Uh, with the CAT tools, for instance, you can uh, just say to them, well, use it, use it, and you will see that it yeah. does good. Yeah. But with MT, it's not so easy sometimes. Yeah. So maybe you have a unique recipe, like something like, read my book and you will find the answer <laughs> there, or something like that. Probably I not. Know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you raise a very, very kind of important point about the stuff I presented at the end. So we say, oh, yeah, post-editing, people are going to be more productive and everybody's going to be happy. And they don't seem to be very happy. And <laughs> And I think the main reason is how machine translation is presented to them. So, I mean, often some people who are not as cautious as I am say, oh, machine translation is perfect, it's going to replace you in 10 years and you're all going to be fired. So they don't like to hear that. Um, they also often are confronted with machine translation by saying, okay, we usually would have paid you X amount of money, but here's the machine translation, we pay you 30% less. That doesn't, you know, make them very happy either. <laughs> and often by people who don't know how good the machine translation quality is, so you might really get just garbage MT ma machine translation, and it, it just slows you down and it just frustrates people. So, yes, uh, I've been occasionally uh, venturing into meetings of professional translators, and they don't like us very much. <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's really about the way machine translation is... I mean, if they would get all the benefit of machine translation, and maybe that happened with translation memory, that after a while they built up their own translation memory stash and didn't tell anybody, so suddenly they were twice as fast at translating, but they still made the same amount of money. Um, so that made them happy. So we need to find a way to maybe get machine translation in the hand of the translators directly. So they can use it and they can control it instead of just the current often setup where they're just being given 
MT and told what to do with it and accept basically wage decrease. So that's maybe a possibility. So in, in, in these European projects I was briefly talking about where we build these cut tools, we basically have a version of the software where you can train your own machine translation system on your own data and then use the, the cut tool. So maybe that's a way to kind of make friends for the translators. So there's, there's really, I learned a lot about tr the whole translation, human translation profession, because there's us building the tools and then there's some client that orders translation and they hire some translation company that then outsource to the so second translation company and then finally somewhere there's a translator and the decision which tool you use and if you use MT or not is somewhere in that pipeline. Might even come from the client who says, okay, you gotta do this with machine translation, therefore I only pay you so much. And so we are kind of perceived as the the evil people behind the client who cuts the wages. So, and we are not, we are friendly, we just try to make things better. Hello, can I ask something, some weird question? Yep. You know, there are several components in natural language processing, such as uh, syntactic analysis, semantic role labeling, I don't know, mm -hmm. discourse parsing, named entity recognition, mm -hmm. morphological analysis. Mm -hmm. Suppose that we build uh, quite a good uh, machine translation system. Yep. Could you think of a way to improve, to make the output of machine translation to uh, improve uh, the quality of other components? Um, so you're saying that machine translation can be used to improve yes, these kind of... Um, there's certainly a lot of work in, not directly machine translation, but in projection of resources. So for instance, for English, you have a lot of like syntactic parsers, and you might be able to use this to improve um, parsers in other languages. Um, just to give an example, like one big problem in parsing is prepositional phrase attachment. So when you have a sentence, like classic sentences like, I see the woman with the telescope, do I use the telescope to see the woman, or does the woman have the telescope? It's like, I don't know, it's a weird example, but that's... <laughs> uh, so it's ambiguous in English, but if you have, a, you have that as a sentence, and you have it as a sentence in Russian, maybe it's not ambiguous at all in Russian because of the way the sentence structure is, maybe in this example, maybe not. And that basically helps you to annotate um, the, the English sentence, and you can then learn from that disambiguation to build better models to, to deal with prepositional phrase attachment. So there's a lot of work on this kind of projection of resources. So you know something is a noun in English, you know it's aligned to that foreign language word, so probably that word is a noun too, so you can automatically induct, induce part of speech tags. So there's, there's definitely work in that area. Okay. And then let's say, for example, there is syntactic person and semantic person. Yeah. And it is quite interesting how they would interplay in different languages. Yeah. Let's say if you have English and French language, yep. and you have quite the perfect tr translation, mm -hmm. right? But can it somehow help? Uh, let's say if you have a reasonably good uh, syntactic person mm -hmm. for yep. English and for French, maybe you have good semantic person for English. But yeah, yeah, and then you can, uh, yeah, it's basically this kind of projection. So if you would think that the semantic representation of the English sentence and the semantic representation of the foreign sentence should be fairly similar, definitely more similar than the surface forms. And b having really good tools in one language might help you then to, to induce good tools in the other language. So there are some people that are very active on this, especially in the case where you have English and then a really resource poor language. So you can learn a lot about the resource poor language by just alignment and projection. So we we'll probably have time for one more question. So somebody has the last question. Machine translation is about mapping text to text, uh, but maybe we can take uh, some other resource to, uh, 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 for mapping. For example, take an uh, image sequence or video and a script of scenario and align them in similar way as with the machine translation. So uh, what do you think? Can we get any good results in this way? Okay, it, it wasn't very loud, so I couldn't... So you're talking about alignment of video sequences to text? And Things like that. Yeah, so how can you use... 
um, yeah, there's. I mean, in a way, it's a it's a it's a mapping problem of of text to text, and um, people use methods kind of out of statistical machine translation also in like vision to text uh, ca captioning of text. Um, the problems always tend to be a bit different. Um, so the field that is most related to machine translation is speech recognition, and there's a lot of kind of crossover. So speech recognition, you have a speech signal and you have to map it to a text signal. Um, some things are easier, um, like there's really only one right answer for speech recognition, and some things are definitely harder, that the input is very noisy. Similar for video and text, I mean there's a lot of pixels on the screen, that it's not as nice as just having a short sequence of words. So yeah, there's, I mean these fields, are there are a lot of fields that are really related, vision, speech, um, machine translation, all kinds of other natural language processing problems. All right, so would you be able to pick one the no, best I'm question? Not They're all great questions. Thank okay, you very much. Uh, so then I'm just going to remind everybody that the video and the presentation would be available at the website where you've registered. And I guess we'll finish here. So let's thank Dr. Cohen for his talk again and for answering the questions. And then we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you.